So we live in a new and strange world. Maybe you remember the movie from a few decades ago, Monty Python's The Life of Brian. There is one scene where there is this group of Judean freedom fighter. They are discussing with each other and suddenly one of the guerrilla members, a man, says, I want to be a woman. I want to have baby. And the, the leader of the, this, this guerrilla is really frustrated and, and objects. And what's the point of fighting for his right to have babies when he can't have babies? And another a woman in the team comes in and says, it's a symbolic of, a, of our struggle against oppression. And then the leader muttered, it's, it's symbolic of his struggle against reality. <laughs> a number of decades ago, we laughed out aloud and thought that was hilarious in its absurdity. This spring, the 8th of March, International Women's Day, the UK politician who aspired to become the next minister in the UK government for women and equality was asked, what is a woman? And she refused to answer. She refused to define what is a woman. But she's fighting for women's rights. J.K. Rowling, who, the author of Harry Potter, she tweeted, someone please send her a dictionary and a backbone. But in the debate following, it was, of course, J.K. Rowling who was criticized on social media. Yesterday, I read in one of the big Swedish newspapers yet another article about sex being assigned to babies when they are born, as if it's kind of random choice done by evil doctors saying if it's a boy or a girl. And we all have noticed that questions about our bodies and sexuality has become such a central point of public and political debate. Sex has been kind of part of a new state religion, a religion where heretics are burnt at the cultural stake. I wholeheartedly affirm your freedom and other people's freedom to choose. But why on earth am I forced to affirm what you choose and other people's choose? I give you the freedom. Must I affirm your choice? How have we come into this situation? How on earth can we understand the meltdown of European culture? Is it possible to understand? We live in this cultural chaos. What to do? about this. I think it's possible, at least to some degree, to understand what has happened, why it has happened, why we are in this strange time. But let me, before I say something about that, underline, I don't believe we have a golden past in Europe. Absolutely not. I'm not arguing for going back in history. I don't want to live in the 16th or 17th or 1800s. I look back at previous generations in Europe, and it was filled with problems. I'm appalled when I see the racism, and I see slavery, and I see the demeaning of women, and I see the oppression of the poor, and see the immense number of brothels all over the whole of Europe. I'm not arguing for the past. But there was a big difference in the past. Not that it was better in all aspects, it was not, but in previous times, there were a common vantage point from which you could critique all those evil things I just mentioned. You had a moral foundation, and you could speak into those issues because people believed in God, or at least there were a number of people believing in God and in his word. And you could reason with people out from reality as a creation from God. And that vantage point has now disappeared. We live in a chaos and have no foundation to, from which we can criticize it. 
Okay, how then to understand why we have come into this chaos? Think of a tree, a big tree, huge tree. And at the, at the outside of the tree, you have all those leaves, thousands and thousands of leaves. And you can fall a leaf into a, a small, thin branch and then into bigger branches and then to the tree itself. Think of that as an image of our culture. Where does this tree gets its life and form from? From the roots. Something that is invisible. You see the tree, but you don't see the immense roots under it, which is the reason why it ha have all those leaves and branches and the form it has. What we see in our culture is dependent upon ideas, not only ideas, but ideas play a crucial role. Ideas are like the invisible root system of our culture. And we need to go from the leaves and branches and the tree down to the level of the roots, what nourishes this culture. This is really important to understand that ideas, what's going on in the mind, actually have consequences. Now, you've understood from Alexander that I come from the Nordic countries. So I need to give you a snow illustration. <laughs> you know, if you have snow and you form a little snowball, and then you can roll it on the ground, and then it grows and grows and grows. So this little snowball can become really big. Ideas going on in our heads that we entertain, they become easily like snowballs, and they grow and they grow and they grow. Think of how the Bible almost starts. It's not the beginning, but when, all, when it went wrong in the Bible. Look here in Genesis 3. Very interesting about what's going on on the inside of the first humans. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Think of it. Can you see that the fruit is good? No, you don't can you can see the taste. That's going on in the mind. There was a snowball starting to rolling. Wow. That fruit, the promise from the snake, and then it rolled on. And you see how the woman in this case, how it's growing in her mind, the idea that it is a good thing to eat of that fruit. So, what are the ideas? What are the snowballs we are rolling in our culture and have been rolling for the last two, two centuries? Let me try to show that in two main points. My first point is the self-made king. And that is about us. The self-made king. You know, not, a lot of, of you have heard about the world value survey. They make surveys, countries all over the world, the different continents, and what values are driving those cultures. And they present it uh, with coordinates to uh, axis. On the one axis, it's if the culture is traditional or secular. Traditional meaning you have a, a religious perspective, or if it's secular. And the other ax, uh, uh, axis is if you're focused on survival, because that's the circumstances you're living in, that you have to have that focus of survival, or if you're focusing on self-expression. Now, if you look at Europe, secular, self-expression, all European countries are here, up in this corner. Secular, focusing on self-expression. And up in the, uh, outside the chart is Sweden. Okay, so we have two characteristics, two ideas, secular and self-expression. Let's analyze them. What do they stand for? That we are a secular culture valuing self-expression. Okay, secular, we use that a lot. What does it mean? It comes from a Latin word, seculum, which has to do with time. And the secular is that which focuses on 
this time, this age, not the coming age. This world, not the coming world. So it's here and now. That is the only important thing. The only relevant is what is here now in this world. Not God, not the spiritual reality, not God's kingdom, not what is coming. It's here and now. That is the secular. And this is so strange. Europe has become a secular culture. Of course, not equally secular in all countries, but we are moving in that direction. A huge part of Europe is deeply secular. And this is, of course, so strange, so surprising. Everywhere you travel in Europe, you will see those beautiful, beautiful buildings with a high tower pointing towards heaven, communicating, there is a God. There is another world. There is a creator. And on the top of the tower, there is a cross. This God who has created us, he has not abandoned us, even though we are sinners. He has come to us in Jesus Christ, and we are welcomed back. So we have this, this symbol of the Christian faith all over Europe, but it's so much of a museum. Because our culture have decided to divorce Christianity. That is what started to happen with the secular enlightenment. The elite, the intellectual elite, divorced Christianity. And then that has continued. And today, in many of our countries, the majority of the people have divorced God, have divorced Christianity. Why? How could that happen? This is really, really dramatic. After 2,000 years in a lot of places, where Christianity have been rooted in Europe, other places more than 1,000 years, like in my country. How did it happen when we divorced ourselves from Christianity? Well, if you study this process before and during and after the Enlightenment, you can see that so much of it, it's not only that, but so much of it was intellectual objections against Christianity. So our culture said, intellectually, you cannot believe in God any longer. You cannot believe in Christianity any longer. It's not rational. Scientifically, they started to say, it does not cohere with science. Science disproves the Christian faith. Historically, they started to say, well, the Bible tells a lot about historical events, but they have actually not happened. It's myths. It's just stories people have created long afterwards. Morally, there came a critique that the Christian ethic is diminishing human life, is oppressive. And even God himself looks immoral if you study the Old Testament, people said. And institutionally, the church and the hierarchy and so on was criticized. Unfortunately, the responses from Christians in Europe was in so many ways inadequate. Number of Christians started to agree with part of the criticism and adjusting the Christian faith and cutting away different aspects of the Christianity so in the end it was just kind of humanistic ethic left. Other Christians, more Bible-believing Christians, retreated into spiritual shelter, saying we don't care about this kind of criticism. And they left the kind of intellectual walk over for the criticism. So there was a lack of adequate apologetics, defense, explaining the Christian faith and defending the faith in the light of all this criticism, which in so many cases was unfounded and could have been answered. So, we have come into a situation where we have divorced ourselves from Christianity. We have become secular. And notice here the, the contrast. Psalm 146 says, Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Secular humanist, humanism in Humanist Manifesto 2 says, No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. That is where we have come to. This is the historical contrast. Our whole culture would have 
affirm the first song 146 earlier. Now the majority of our culture is affirming no deity will save us. We must save ourselves. So we had kicked out Christianity and the gospel. So we are now secular. It's here and now and we. That is the important thing. But you cannot be neutral. You kick away one worldview, one belief system, one understanding of who you are, it will be replaced by something else. And what has taken the place of the Christian faith is secular humanism. And you can see that is the international logo of humanism. It's the happy human, raising hands in freedom, free at last from God and Christianity and the Bible. The joy of being free. But notice one thing, this logo is one individual. That is significant. It is the individual who now stands free and for a moment imagine the wonder of being free. So, we've dethroned God, the real king, and we have become the self-made king. Let's move on to the second word, self-expression. And let's use the same words, but pronounce them slightly different. The self-made king. That is the next step. The self-made king. That is what has happened in our culture. Self-expression has now come into center of our understanding of the human existence. There is a long history, if you're interested in philosophy, that you can see that philosophers in Europe, actually uh, already time before the Enlightenment, started to move in this direction of emphasizing the individual self, the individual mind. I think, therefore I am Descartes, or Rousseau, or Immanuel Kant, or Nietzsche. You could follow those in different ways. They put the individual at the center. Maybe the most obvious example is the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. In his famous book, Existentialism is a Humanism, he has a, a very illuminating phrase. He talks about our past when we believed in God. And he says, when we believed in God, we couldn't imagine our existence like this. God was there, and he thought about what to create. And in his mind, he decided, I want to create human beings in my image, in the likeness of me. And then, what was in his mind, he gave existence. So, according to Jean-Paul Sartre, the human essence was in the mind of God first, before there existed, existed any human beings, and then he gave them existence. And now, he said, since there is no God, we need to turn those phrases on their head. There is no God, therefore there is no human essence. You cannot define what a human being is. We just exist. We are thrown into this world and we have no essence. We have no identity. We just exist. And it's up to us to give ourselves an essence, to choose who we are. That is a very radical perspective on the human being. You have no essence. You exist and then you give yourself the essence. But it follows naturally from secularism and secular humanism. It moves into, okay, what is left is my self. And I define what that is. Now, this is such a huge, huge difference compared to people in Europe traditionally have thought. So, you go back before this kind of thinking and you have an individual, and of course, human beings have always reflected over themselves, have had a self and an inner life and strong feelings and, and all the struggles going on within oneself, but the individual self 
had been placed in a context of a number of circles around that self. So you were born into a family, and that very often defined who you were, and you were born into a certain culture, and that culture was to a high degree defined by the church and the teaching of the Bible. And above it all, it was God who gave essence to everything that existed because he was the creator. Now, quite often, let me be really clear, quite often those circles, those contexts people were born into could be oppressive and destructive. The family could be oppressive. Culture could be oppressive because you were divided into different social classes and if you were born into that class, a lot of opportunities were, was not possible for you. And we can think of all different kinds of, of things that were negative, so I'm not defending anything of that. But still there were these this circles of context that gave meaning and identity to the individual. You were born into a life of relationships, of identities, and even if some of those relationships and identities were far from right, the whole concept of identity and meaning and having in place was there. Now, what has happened now is that we have taken away God, the ultimate context for our human lives. And then, of course, the other circles in one sense are there, family and culture and, and even church uh, in one sense are there. But all those contexts have become fluid, soft. They don't define very much any longer. The individual self is always stronger and more important than those contexts. And the whole authority structure have broken down. So here we have the individual self in a situation where self-expression is the way forward. Now, I need to define myself. I need to find a way without relating to different contexts outside myself. Now, in this situation, some other factors comes in that does not have directly with ideas to do. So, we do not only deal with ideas. During the 20th century, and uh, with increasing speed in the 21st century, a number of things have added to this picture. First, technology. We have been able to, to break borders and limits. We've been able to travel huge distances, to travel all over the world. Through technology, from the telegraph to the telephone to the mobile, suddenly we can connect with everyone everywhere simultaneously. And now through internet, all borders and limits are kind of gone. And we can, we can create an, a virtual reality. We can go back and forth between so many different worlds. And we can connect with people and then disconnect them. And something happened and we don't like that person, we just block them and they are out of the picture. And, and this, of course, makes the self just grow immense possibility for me to create whatever world I want. And then commercialization comes in with new products all the time. And of course, the PR machine and advertisement sell us the idea that by this product, product, you can start to express yourself. This new product will give you an identity. And we buy into that stupid idea that that thing or those clothes so that that will show who I'm actually is. And of course, there come in some political uh, issues in terms of globalization, where we have been for many years now running in the direction of taking away as many borders and limits as possible. And those three factors cooperate with this basic background of ideas, of the secular, of self-expression, and then with technology and business and politics. This has just gone wild 
for the last two or three decades. The inner self has been elevated to be the ultimate authority everywhere. You can think of, of another issue just to illustrate this. All cultures have to deal with questions of good and evil. You have to differentiate between good and evil. You have to make moral statements. And culture, cultures are doing that slightly different. Some cultures work with the concept of guilt and innocence. Other more with honor and shame. Other with purity and impurity or with power or weakness. Okay, so you can structure th your thinking slightly different here around different concepts. What are the concepts we are structuring good and evil around today? Pleasure and pain. Pleasure and pain is the moral criteria. What myself experiences as pleasurable is good. If it causes me emotional pain, it's evil. Into this picture comes an old man called Sigmund Freud. Or his ideas is underpinning quite a lot of this, even though he has been dead for so long time. And academically, his work is discredited. But Freud, in his thinking, is quite clear that sexuality is the key aspect who we are. Man's discovery that sexual love afforded him the strongest experience of satisfaction and in fact provided him with the prototype of all happiness must have suggested to him that he could continue to seek the satisfaction of happiness in his life along the path of sexual relationships. And don't think that was an exaggerated paraphrase. That was an exact quote from his book, Civilization and Discontents. His idea is that sexual happiness is the key thing for human happiness. So he identified sexuality with the most basic aspects of human life, and it's there we can find happiness. So you see what's happening if you have these two ideas, pleasure and pain, that's how we differentiate between good and evil. And then you have the idea of sex being the most important aspect of human existence. The American sociologist Philip Reif, he has said, religious man, and he means when we still believed in God, religious man was born to be saved. Psychological man is born to be pleased. Psychological man, that's us today, is born to be pleased. This has together created the perfect storm for our culture. There is no God, the self is at the center of the universe, and sexuality is at the center of self. Do you see how this works together to create the perfect storm? There is no God, the self is at the center of the universe, and sexuality is the center of the self. What does the future look for a culture that moves in this direction? I've, we might have a lot of problems in front of us. We as Christians, we would of course argue for pluralism. We would like to give protection for everyone, religious freedom for everyone, and the right for us to formulate our own thinking and also publicly express our convictions. But so much in our culture today is moving in another direction, in the totalitarian direction. Not in terms of the system of democracy being replaced, we can still vote, but culturally, you are not free to think and decide and express yourself. So in many ways, we are moving in a situation where Christians 
are viewed today like the first Christians were viewed by the Romans as enemies to the human race. That was sometimes how the Christians were viewed. And the Christians were called atheists because they did not bow down to Rome or to Caesar, and therefore they were persecuted. Any kind of similar way, I think we need to be honest that we can face a situation where we became the heretics in the new state religion in Europe. So how should we react to this? The Australian theologian uh, Michael Bird, he has outlined different options. He said, well, one option for the church could be what he called the Stockholm Syndrome, if you remember that. That is when people have been kidnapped, start to sympathize with the kidnappers, start to bond with what is actually their enemies. So if you can't beat them, join them. And liberal theology goes that way. So that's not an option. His, a second possibility would be the Benedict option. With this, he means, well, it's a hostile culture. Christians, the option we have is to withdraw from culture and create virtuous communities where we can live for ourselves and, and express our values. The problem here is that in the modern society, with the kinds of state we have, the state reaches everywhere. And you cannot withdraw from all else in your culture. So that is not an option. Maybe a third, he suggests, could be hope for a great Christian prince, as he formulates it. Should we hope for a strong Christian politician who can turn everything around and make it right again? Well, there's not much hope for that. The problem is much deeper, and no politicians can make that right. So what should we do, finally? There is another king. There is another king. And Michael Byrd, he calls this the Thessalonian strategy, which is what he advocates, and I 100% agree. And he, <clears throat> he goes to Acts chapter 17 and to what happened in Thessalonian, when Paul had preached the gospel and people have come to faith and there has been established a church, and it causes a lot of turmoil. And then we can read in Acts 17, verse 6 and 7, these men, that is the Christians here, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. So the first Christians turned the world upside down. They resisted their own cultural system when it was confronting their confession of Jesus as Lord. They turned the world upside down. They had the courage to stand for their conviction. And they proclaimed Jesus is Lord. Not Caesar, not Rome, not any human authority. At the same time, they served the people around them. But they proclaimed Jesus as Lord. And they were prepared to take the cost of causing the turmoil of turning the world upside down. They resisted the system. They hold on to the confession that Jesus is Lord. And I think this is what we need to do in our time. We need to train ourselves to resist the system, the cultural system, where it goes against our fundamental convictions. And we need to fight for our right to proclaim Jesus as Lord. We respect other people's right to proclaim their convictions, and we should claim our right to proclaim our conviction. They resisted the system, they proclaimed Jesus as Lord, and they did what was so inadequate when secularism arose in Europe. They did really good apologetics, the defense of the faith.
because it's that about uh, uh, Paul when he came to Thessalonia and this revival broke out and the church was established that he reasoned with the people there from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. So we need to combine the proclamation with this recent defense of our faith. Now, a well-known Swedish Christian leader, he recently said this, Review, refusing to accept the LGBT, LGBTQI plus agenda. We have some other letters in Swedish, Swedish it's uh, complicated. Refusing to accept the LGBTQI plus agenda is the worst mistake of the church in this generation, he's claimed. It's the worst mistake of this generation. So he takes really the opposite perspective than, uh, than what I have talked about here today. My response to that is, our generation? If your accusation is true, it's a mistake all through church history from the first generation until today. Notice here something very important. We look at many of the failures of the church in history. We look at slavery and racism and women's rights and religious freedom and the church have failed so often. But notice, when we see those failings, the solution is always in the New Testament. It's always in the first generation of Christians. So when we fight those injustices, we can always go back to the New Testament, to the first Christians, and find the motivation to, to fight those injustices. There is a trajectory from the first Christians to the problems, or to the solution to, of the problems in church history. When it comes to the LGBTQI agenda, we see the opposite. The New Testament and the first generations of Christians took a different stand on sexuality than the culture around them did. And after several centuries of proclaiming the gospel and establishing churches and arguing for the Christian faith and loving people around them, the view of sexuality was transformed in the Roman Empire. Not by force, but by preaching the gospel and by arguing for the truth. There is no trajectory from the New Testament and from the first Christians to today's LGBTQI agenda. On the contrary, the trajectory goes the other way round. So, let me end. We as Christians, we want clearly to fight for a free society with respect for diversity, with respect for personal choices. We want protection for the individual. No one should be hated or harassed or oppressed. We are called to show compassion and love for everyone suffering and in pain. But we must also constantly remind ourselves that God is greater than our specific cultural moment and that truth prevails over passing trends. And therefore, we must continue to confess that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Jesus is Lord, not our cultural moment.